that series has been what? <laughs> Biblical prosperity. <laughs> Biblical prosperity. So we've been talking about, uh, it, well, was it, is it God's will for us to prosper? And we found out in the first lesson that it is God's will for us to prosper. It has always been His design. From the time that God created Adam and Eve, the first thing He spoke to Adam and Eve was, You're blessed. You're blessed. And He's never changed His mind concerning His will for man. Then we look at Abraham and how he dedicated his life to God and obeyed God and went out and, and let God be the one that supplies all his needs. And he came out of Haran that was a thriving business place. And he says, come out from there and go into a desert place and I will prosper you. And Abraham says, okay, I will completely trust that you're the one that's my source. And he got out there. And if we were to interview Abraham today and ask him, you know, is God a prosperous God or is there's, there's that he holds back on you? He'd say, are you kidding? He made me so rich, I didn't know what to do with it all. That'd be his testimony. And that was true with Isaac, his son. He was, there was a famine in the land and he was going to go down to Egypt with everybody else because, you know, that's where you escape the famine is down in Egypt because that's where the Nile River continues to flow and, and they've got spots down there for people and you can get on down there and, and, and wait out the famine and then come back up. And God came to him and he goes, you know what? I blessed your father during a famine and I'll bless you during a famine. You stay right here in this land. Don't you go down to Egypt and I'll bless you. So he obeyed God and says, okay, I'll stay here and I'll depend on you, God. You're, while everybody else is starving out, everybody plants crops and they just dry up. They dig a well and it's nothing but dirt is all they get out of it. Isaac, on the other hand, said that very year he planted seed while everybody else around him is going, you're wasting seed, dude. I mean, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, we're in a famine. There ain't no way those seeds are going to grow. He reaped a hundredfold that year. Famine don't have nothing to do with the blessing of God. The blessing of God works even in a famine. And so he was blessed because he put his total trust in God concerning his welfare. And then we learned last week that Jacob did the same thing. So, you know, Jacob, he, he goes out and he's, he, uh, uh, all he's got is his backpack. He's running from his brother. All he's got is his backpack. He's he heading to Haran to his uncle's house. And partway there, he decides he's going to sleep. And while he's there, he, dis he discovers there's an open heaven above him. And angels ascending and descending upon him. And when he woke up, he goes, man, this is the gate of heaven. So he set up a monument there. And he says, and God spoke to him and says, I'm going to take care of you. You trust me. I'll take care of all your needs. I'll bring you out of this a lot richer than you've ever been rich. And you're going to be a blessing as you go back home. You just trust in me. And he says, well, if you're the one that's going to increase me, if you're the one that's going to bless me, if that's true, then I'm going to give you a tenth of everything you bless me with. He's operating in kingdom law. So that's what we had discussed last week. And, and we do record these. So if you want to go back and review any of these lessons, you can on charisfamily.org. You can review these lessons. Now we're going to go on to biblical prosperity, talking about the beginning of wisdom. To prosper, we need wisdom in our lives, don't we? But not just any wisdom, the worldly wisdom can only go so far, but the wisdom of God will supersede the wisdom of this world. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, 25. So fear or trusts are interchangeable. This word fear doesn't mean, God, don't strike me down. It's not being fearful of him. It is reverencing him. The fear of the Lord is putting him first place, to give him his rightful place in your life. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's not cowarding before him, but putting him first place. So trust what God says more than what man says. Don't let man's wisdom and their pressure tell you 
one thing, and then when God says, well, no, well, you know what? There's, there's greater wisdom than that. This is what the Word says. When God speaks something, then you put man's wisdom aside and you follow God's wisdom. And when you do, when you trust Him, you prosper. Now we have a, a white kitty. We had inherited him a number of years ago. He just showed up on our back deck and he was always afraid of us. Every time I would crack just a sliding glass door open a little bit, he'd take off and run her into the deck. And he lived under that deck for a good solid year that he wouldn't have anything to do with us. Now he would lay out there on the deck with the dog and with the other cat that we had. They'd be all out there in the sun and enjoying it. But as soon as I would keek a little bit on the sliding glass door, woo, he was up and he was under the deck. He didn't trust man. He didn't trust people. And so it took, um, I, I had stayed home one summer and uh, I'd left the sliding glass door open just a little bit and, and, I, and I'm studying and all of a sudden I see him, he pokes his head in the sliding glass door and looks around. And he creeps in a little bit and he looks around. And then I just make one little move and he goes, whoop, whoop, and he takes back out and tears off back out. During the summer, though, he got more brave and more brave and more brave. Eventually, he found where the cat's food was, and so he'd jump over the gate, and he would eat some food and drink some water, and he'd jump back out and tear out of the house. Well, eventually, I got to the place to where I decided, well, while he was in the study and they're eating, I kind of creeped up in the living room, and I came down like this, and I, was, I put my hand out. And when he jumped back over the gate, he goes, and he comes up, and he sniffs my hand, and then he rubbed my hand with his head. And then I kind of scratched his head. From then on, we've been buds. It took a while though, for a whole year, he lived under that deck and he survived on whatever he could get. Whether it was snowing, blowing, cold. And we didn't feed him. We didn't, you know, we thought, well, maybe he'll go away. <laughs> he stuck around and stuck around and stuck around. And he just survived off the land. I want you to notice that once he learned to trust me, his standard of living popped up significantly. Now he's eating some good cat food. We got this little thing set up to where he jumps up on this bench and there's like a little table. He's got a, a food dish and when he jumps up there, we call it the kitty cafe. When he jumps up there, he's like that and he's waiting. And I take and give him a spoonful of meat and put it in his little dish and he eats it, and, you know. Man, that guy, his life has improved a great deal. Why? Because now he trusts me. We've got to learn to trust God. I mean, your standard of living is going to increase if you trust him. Amen. Now, this is important that now, I mean, he can he sleep on our bed, sleeps, you know, jump up in my lap, and he gets pet and takes a nap. I mean, he is living the high life now. Because he's learned to trust. Psalms 111.10. Psalms 111.10. The fear or the reverence, reverencing of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all, the, all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Notice that when we reverence Him, when we put Him first place, notice that the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's the starting point of wisdom. We don't exhaust our man-made wisdom and then finally come to the place, <sighs> everything's a disaster. It's finally come to the place where we're going to have to pray. And so many of us, we exhaust all of our own wisdom before we finally go, okay, I, I've tried everything. Okay, God. <laughs> But He should be the beginning of our wisdom. He should be the first that we go to. It should be His wisdom and His understanding and His knowledge is what we seek after first. And when we do, we're a lot more fruitful in our lives. Knowledge equals information. But computers have that. They have information in them. They have knowledge in them. But wisdom is the ability to take that knowledge and be fruitful with it. Now you can either take that wisdom from the world or take the wisdom from God to take the knowledge and take the understanding 
and go forward with it. How fruitful are you going to be? Whose wisdom are you reaching for? And that you're standing in faith and doing. Amen. He's the beginning of wisdom, not man. The government did a three-year study and, pay, and did $30 million on this study. People that smile are happier than people who frown. $30 million and three years later, that's their conclusion. That's man's wisdom. Huh? No, happy people smile more. That didn't cost that and the government a dime. It's just that when you're happy, you smile more. Amen. And that's just plain better wisdom than man spending three years and $30 million coming up with that. Knowledge can bring about weird conclusions if there's no wisdom attached to it. So the reverence of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's clear, proper, and has a good conclusion. In Genesis 1.1 it says... In the beginning was God. So in the beginning was God's wisdom was present. He's the beginning. That's who we should go to first. Remember Psalms 11.10 that we have had up there. It's that the beginning of wisdom is God. So if the beginning of wisdom is God and God was from the beginning, that wisdom has been around a while. It has been around from the beginning of all of His creation. It's just that we're playing catch-up, aren't we? I'm going to show you some examples of that here a little later. Psalms 1-7. Psalms 1-7 says, For the reverence and the fear and reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9-10. Proverbs 9.10 The reverence or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Knowing God brings understanding. Proverbs 15.33 Proverbs 15.33 well, The reverence and the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. In the Amplified it says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord brings instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. We've got to humble ourselves before His wisdom. And quit starting to think, you know, thinking that you know everything. Well, I got degrees, man. And, and, I mean, I know what I'm doing. And the next thing you know, you're in trouble. The beginning of wisdom is having that intimate reverence for God. That's where the instruction in wisdom is. We've got to humble ourselves to that. Proverbs 21.30 Proverbs 21.30 There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. In the Amplified it says, there is no human wisdom or understanding or counsel that can prevail against the Lord. In other words, He is the final wisdom. If you've got a choice between this is what the Word says and this is what man says, you go with God's wisdom. He is the final say. Chances are, this is not going to be very good material. It's going to fall short. But God's wisdom is perfect. It's perfect wisdom. Most spirit-filled Christians would embrace this, that God's the one that has the ultimate wisdom. But the worldly media and ungodly would mock such things. This makes them fools, not wise. Psalms 14.1 The word is full of this principle. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have been abominable works. 
There is none who does good. It's the fool who does not believe in God. Yet God is the beginning, the starting point of all wisdom. So you have people with PhDs, all kinds of paper hanging on their wall with little frames around them. And everybody goes, these guys must know what they're talking about. Look at all those diplomas. Look at all of that accomplishment. It's all man's wisdom. I'll show you examples of where God was way out ahead of scientists in the things that were said in the Word of God and man's playing catch-up. Yes, the PhDs of their day believe some of the most wacky things that we look back on now and go, oh. but back then you didn't argue with these guys. They had the diplomas on the wall. They're the ones of final authority. They got all the wisdom. No, I'm sorry, they don't. I don't care if they have triple PhDs. If it doesn't line up with what the Word says, the beginning, beginning of wisdom, then that wisdom falls flat. And for us to take that wisdom over His wisdom is foolishness. Universities started, many of them back east, the universities were started by Christians. They were Christian uh, organizations. And over time, secular people took them over and, became, and brought them to what they are today. They used to thrive on the wisdom of God when they were founded. But now it's the wisdom of, uh, of man that has now perpetuated them. And you can see where we're at today. You only got to watch the news and the things that are coming out of those colleges and the students when you interview them out there on the campus grounds, some of the crazy stuff that comes out of their mouth and comes out of their brain. Where'd they learn that? From the wisdom of men in that men-inspired college and university. Instead of the wisdom of God flowing. Amen. And it's the professors that are teaching our youth this kind of wisdom. And that's not prospering our country. We're not going up. We're going down. This kind of wisdom will impoverish you. The wisdom of God prospers you. Psalms 19.1 Let's look at some examples now of how God's wisdom was centuries uh, millenniums jumps ahead of man's wisdom. Psalms 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament, the firmament, fir, firmament, firmament shows His handiwork. Whew. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no, no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, it transcends the language barrier. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words, what words? Nature and creation's words, that's doing the declaring and the showing. Their words, to the end of the world, in them we have set a tabernacle for the sun. Creation declares God's glory, His very existence. Creation itself declares it. His wisdom is in His creation. And, it, and, and that creation declares, the word declare means to score with a mark as a tally or record. In other words, as it says here, the heavens declare the glory of God. It, it, it records, it's a recording or a tally of that. Look at, the, look at creation, it's yelling at us. I am evidence of God and His wisdom. In fact, the word show here where it says in the firmament shows His handiwork. Shows means stands out boldly or shouts out. So all of His creation is shouting to us, God's wisdom, pay attention here. Don't take for granted what's around you. All of His creation is declaring unto us His wisdom, His understanding, and His knowledge. In fact, in Romans 1.18, Romans 1.18, Paul says that creation leaves no excuse 
for denying God's existence. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested where? In them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. See, all of his creation is a testimony of who God is. So that no man, there is nobody with excuse to say, oh, I, I didn't know anything about God. You needed to look at his creation. It was crying out to you. And his very wisdom, his, the very knowledge of God is seen in our creation. And you know the more scientists dig into creation, they're learning, they're getting wiser, they're understanding things. But the beginning of that is who created it? God. Don't you want to just go to the source? Let's just go to the source, shall we? That's who we want to go to, the source. In fact, it goes on to say, without going in, you know, reading the rest of the chapter, those that don't recognize the shouting of creation, they don't recognize God in creation, they start worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And they fall into more depravity and more depravity until, the, until society is absolutely destroyed. This is what happens when we pick up man's wisdom rather than God's wisdom. And don't honor him first. And don't reverence him first. You know, America was built on reverencing God first. But as we've pulled away and pulled away and pulled away, as we've gotten God out of our school system, the education level has an increase, it's decreased. Because every time you pluck the source of wisdom out of learning institutions, then you're on God, a men's wisdom in their institutions, and it falls way short from God's wisdom and understanding. Wow. So there is no prosperity in man's wisdom compared to God's wisdom. Amen. So God created everything. We can't even create a blade of grass. I mean, that's how wise we are. We can take his creation, manipulate it like we can take a tree and cut it down and make a table out of it, but it's still, you haven't created really anything. You just converted one source of material that God created and turned it into something else. But you didn't create anything. And yet we're all puffed up. Hey, we can't even create a, a blade of grass. If you found a house, now watch this. If you found a house, you go hiking into the forest and you stumble across a house out in the forest, you don't say, wow, look at that house just showed up out of the ground. Like a mushroom, it just went whoop. Now see, we laugh about that, but creationists would say, yeah, yeah that, that, that could, could have been. Could have happened. Or not creationists, I mean evolutionists. Evolutionist. Oh, son of a... Okay. Yeah, evolutionists would say, no, but that's true. It could have happened that way. Absolutely. The people with PhDs on their walls today would tell you and say that. And yet we go to universities, sit under them, pay large sums of money, go into debt for our entire life to listen to them tell us this kind of wisdom. Let's go to the source. Let's go to the source. Mathematics says that 10 to the second power, anything that's 10 to the second power is impossible. And yet, evolution, and they'll admit this in their own books, evolution is 10 to the 1 trillionth power of it coming to pass, of it ever happening of it springing from nothing to something, just randomly, boom. Let alone the complexity of the entire world that we have and all the different living organisms that we have on this planet. They would rather believe in a 10 to the trillionth power odds than to believe that there was an intelligent being that created all of this. 
to me, they got more faith than I got. <laughs> it is the equivalent of taking a, a, a Boeing 747, put it in a giant hangar, all the little parts and pieces, every bolt, every washer, every component, laying it all out, setting a bomb in the middle of that warehouse, pulling the, the, the trigger on that sucker. It blows up, and after the smoke clears, there's a perfectly good Boeing 747 ready to, to, to push out of the hangar and fly. And there's a better chance of that than evolution. Because at least somebody built the components that made it possible for them to come together. We don't even have that in evolution. The wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. What will you embrace? Just because they have PhDs and diplomas all over the wall doesn't mean that they got it together, do they? They're, they're sorely lacking because they don't start with the wisdom of God. When you start with God's wisdom, then you come out to a much better conclusion. Amen. They had uh, scientists, you know, the odds are better parts. Okay, science says that big, you know, the Big Bang Theory and order began out of a bang. In Genesis 1-3 it says, let there be light and there was light. In other words, and if you read this in the, in the, in the Hebrew, it says light be and light was. Boy, light be, bang, light was. And the light that's talked about there is matter. He said, let matter be. Boom, there it was. So we're getting closer. There was a bang, all right. That started all of this. In fact, until 1924, scientists believe in the static universe theory. In other words, the universe was eternal. It has no beginning and has no end. That was the standard PhD think of that time. And if you contradicted that, they would say, you don't, man, you don't ascribe to science. I mean, you're design, you, you are um, uh, denying scientific fact. Where have you heard this stuff before? Because this is, this is what science is, and this is what the truth is, and truth is that the universe is from the from eternal uh, beginning to an eternal future, and nothing changes in between. And they believed that until Einstein came along. And Einstein in 1924, a scientist believed, uh, Einstein started the Big Bang Theory. The universe has a beginning. And now when they, when they took that wisdom and they began to run experiments and they began to, to, to work with, with formulas and things like that. They come to find out, they went, Einstein was right. He's right. There's a beginning to all this. And they can begin to start measuring it. Where did Einstein get that? Where did Einstein get the idea that there was a beginning to all things? Genesis 1 1. Einstein was a Christian, he understood. He took the wisdom of God. He started with the wisdom of God and went from there. And when he did, he found real truth and defied the wisdom of the PhDs of that day. And now, <laughs> that standard, if you were to go back now and go, well, now there's an eternal, you know, the universe is eternal. Scientists look at him and go, now, now pff, you guys are all wrong, man. There is a beginning. We can, we can measure it today. Man is always catching up with their wisdom. They're playing catch up. I'm going to show you some more other examples of man playing catch up. We had here at the Bible College, uh, Dr. Carl Ball. You ever heard of him? Dr. Carl Ball was down um, in Glen Rose, Texas. And they had noticed that there were dinosaur footprints. I mean, right on the surface. There's a dinosaur footprint. There's a dinosaur footprint. And so he got permission from the rancher who owned the land. He says, well, can I go in and kind of excavate that? I mean, I want to kind of check this thing out. And it was an old riverbed that had, uh, you know, 
over a long period of time it dried up and, and turned hard and these dinosaur footprints were just perfectly preserved. And so he started going in and he was picking up, it was like a limestone, he's picking it up and underneath there was shell. And, and as he'd pick up these big sheets with a backhoe, perfectly preserved dinosaur footprints, left, right, left, right, you know, and he's going, this is cool. I mean, they could track the dinosaur and they were, and all of a sudden this human footprint goes tink, 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 tink across the path. Modern human footprints. In fact, one of them stepped right in the dinosaur footprint and went on. It was perfectly preserved with the dinosaur footprints. What this tells us is that man walked in the days of dinosaurs. Well, that is not the evolutionary model. Dinosaurs died out a million years before man came on the scene. So how can this be? That takes the evolutionary model and squishes it down to a small amount of time, which blows evolution, because evolution demands a long, long period of time and for, for, for that theory to work. And so when they found this out, he, he tried to, it changed his life forever. It changed his life. He's going, if this is true, then, <gasps> and he became a Christian. And he's got an awesome museum down there, Creation Evidence Museum down Glen Rose, Texas, by the Paluxy River, where he found these dinosaur footprints. I'll tell you what, uh, Sherris and I went through that a couple of, well, about three years ago, maybe three, four years ago, something like that. We went down and went to that museum. There is no way that you can go into that museum and come out and be an atheist unless you're just hard-hearted. The evidence that's in there, he's got all kinds of pottery in there to where, uh, I mean, ancient pottery that has dinosaurs carved into their bowls and their dishes. Dinosaurs, where they're interacting with dinosaurs. Not just one, but all, he, he's found this spread out across the land. And he's got a huge collection of these pieces of pottery and stuff where, where they have carved about dinosaurs and, you know, and them interacting with them on the dishes and on the plates and things like this. Absolutely. But the PhDs won't come down and look at, oh, it's got to be fake. It's got to be fake. It's got to be fake. You've you, you got to be making this up. You, you, you. Hmm? Wow. All right, so, so let's look at some examples of where Scripture was way ahead of the PhDs. Job 26, 7. Job 26, 7. These are pretty exciting. Job 26, 7. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Now, what he's saying there is that the earth is free floating in space. It's free floating. It's not, it's not nothing supporting it. Affected only by, by uh, gravity. While other sources declare the earth was on the back of an elephant or the back of a turtle <laughs> back in those days. I mean, they had no explanation. God is declaring, the beginning of wisdom, God is declaring that the earth is hanging free form on its own and nothing is holding it up. Like, you know, the, back in the Greek days, Atlas held the earth. You ever seen, seen those? Atlas held the earth. Even in the days of the Greeks, they didn't understand that the earth hung by itself. If they just went to the wisdom of God, he's the beginning of all wisdom. The PhDs would have been way ahead, but instead they were still depending on man's wisdom. Go to Genesis 6.15 now. Genesis 6.15 says, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubics, its width 50 cubics and its height 30 cubics. Now how did he know how to build a ship of this magnitude when nobody's ever built a ship to begin with because there was no water to put it in? Remember this is before the flood. This is how the oceans were created was after the flood. So to put a huge sea-bearing vessel in the water like 
So where did he get the wisdom to do this? Because the Bible specifies the perfect dimensions for a stable watercraft. Shipbuilders today are well aware that the ideal dimensions for ship stability is a length six times that of the width. Shipbuilders to this day build ships by the dimensions of what Noah was given to build a boat. To be stable in large bodies of water. Now how in the world did he get this? He got it from God. The wisdom begins with God. Wow. And it's taken man all these years to catch up. And go, wow, you know what? By golly, with all the tests we've run, and that boat that Noah built is perfect. You make it, if you skew from those numbers, it becomes less stable. We should have just went with him to begin with. But these guys have PhDs in engineering. How could, how could the Bible be right over these guys? Eventually they came into the fold and said, you know what? Uh, the Bible is true. Let's just go with him. Wow. It would be behoove us to know what the Bible says, to know what the Word of God says, His wisdom and His Word, and go with what He tells us versus what conventional man's wisdom is. Amen. Now I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. Isaiah 40, 22. I ain't done with you yet. Isaiah 40, 22. talking about the wisdom of God that's written right here for us. It's superior to man's wisdom. It is he who sets above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Notice that what he's, de what he's describing here is that the earth is a sphere. At a time when Many thought the earth was flat. The Bible told us that the earth was spherical. In fact, clear in the days of, of Columbus, they struggled with that idea. In fact, it was Columbus that read the scriptures and go, I don't believe the earth is fl uh, flat. I don't believe I'm going to fall off. I believe it's spherical because the Bible says so. And so I'm going to take a chance and I'm going to mount up some boats and we're going to head off towards this drop off that everybody claims it's there, and I'm going to prove you wrong. And he did. And he started with the wisdom of the word first, God's wisdom. Man. That's amazing, isn't it? we got to start with God's wisdom first. What his word says is final authority. I don't care what the PhDs tell you. What does the word say? And if you take what the Word says over what the PhDs say, you're going to prosper. You're going to prosper. Luke uh, 17, Luke 17, 34. This is Jesus. Now, a lot of this, we just read it, and because it's so common knowledge to us, I mean, we just brush past it and don't realize what's being said there. You have to understand, at the time... They didn't have this kind of man-made, didn't have this kind of wisdom. They didn't understand these things. Luke 17, 34. And this is Jesus, and he says, I tell you, in that night, he's talking about when he's going to come for his people. In that night, there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other one will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, the other one left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other one left. Now, we, we read that and, and because we understand that the world is round and that the world, you know, it can be night on one side of the planet and day on the other side of the planet. And that's what's common knowledge that we just read right past that, but not to realize that they didn't understand that there was day and night could exist at the same time. They didn't understand that back then. And Jesus talking about the revolving sphere of earth. Jesus said that 
At his return, some would be asleep at night, while others would be working at day, doing day activities out in the field. Then it would all happen at, all in, at one time. Wow. That went beyond the wisdom of man back in those days. They had no concept of that back then. Once again, the wisdom, you read the scriptures carefully. There is so much revelation in it. That you could come across something that's not even common to man. Not even common to the present day think that the word defies what the PhDs and the wise guys are telling you. And then you get in the word and you go, yeah, but you know the word says this. So what do I go for? Do I do, I do it what the experts are telling me to do? Or do I do it what God's, how he's telling me to do it? Go with God every time. Go with God every time. Psalms 102, 25. Psalms 102.25. Are you getting something today? I mean, this is the kind of stuff, yeah, write this stuff down, man, because this is the stuff that you can share with, with other people, even unbelievers. It just kind of throws them these things. Psalms 102.25. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. But you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. What's being described there is the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. And this law states that everything in the universe is running down, deteriorating, constantly excuse me, constantly becoming less and less orderly. And that's a scientific law of today's PhDs. And they agree with the word there, that everything is going into decay. Now the PhDs have given it a fancy name. But it's getting constantly getting less and less orderly. Entropy or disorder, historically most people believe the universe was unchangeable. Remember we were talking about the forever universe from past to the future they believed there was no change there was nothing was running down nothing was getting better nothing was getting worse but here God is going no things are deteriorating and believe me he built his creation to sustain its purpose and once his purpose is over he'll just fold it up cast it off and start all over again we see that in the book of Revelations. We see that, you know, Peter talks about that. It's going to be a fervent heat, going to melt all this down. You know, people say, talk about global warming. Uh, I believe in global meltdown. Because he's going to melt it all down and start all over, make a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. That's the way it's going to go. I mean, I read the back of the book, this is the way it ends. He gets rid, gets rid of all the deterioration, all the sin, everything that has decayed everything. He throws it all into the abyss and remakes it all. Can you imagine? It's hard for us. We can't even imagine. It's hard for our brains to wrap around that. To have absolutely no devils pressing you. No sin. No nothing. It's perfect, blessed paradise. Deal with, there's no wickedness. There's no evil. There's no devil. There's no demons. There's nothing. Every, all the flaws have been melted down and everything's been remade again back to the way it was before Adam and Eve corrupted it. That's our future. Whew. I look forward to that. Every day I say, come Jesus, come. But everybody's in a panic. Well, now everything is it's getting worse. We had, we got... You know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of the environment, and that we shouldn't be responsible for God's creation, but we spend our times wringing our hands worrying about whether or not, you know, the ice is going to melt and it's going to flood the cities and all this kind of stuff. Hey, man, I don't know if you've read Revelations, but there's going to be a lot more going to be happening to this planet before it's over. 
be stuff falling from the sky and, and wiping out a third of the oceans and burning up a third of the land and whew, you ain't seen nothing yet. But it's all going to be to accumulate into this. It's all going to be burned up, moved away, and everything's going to be remade. And we're going to have a good time. Hey Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Whew. Genesis 17, 12. Coming down to the end here. I'm going to share, let me share one more with you. In Genesis 17, 12, God has given direction. And he says this to Abram. He who, uh, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. So any, any of that that are born, eight days after they were born, they'll be circumcised. Every male child in your generation, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. Circumcision on the eighth day is ideal. Now, I don't know, and there's no way he could have known that. This is God's wisdom. Wisdom starts with God. Medical science has discovered that the blood clotting chemical uh, prothrombin, I don't know how to say that word, peaks, it's the blood clotting properties, peaks at eight days. And that's when God told him to circumcise the kids on the eighth day. And scientists says, yeah, that's when the blood clotting properties are at its peak for a child. How could he have known that? It's the wisdom of God. When, you, you, when he is the beginning of wisdom, you're going to prosper. You're going to win. Whew. When you do it God's way. When you hear him and do it his way. Science will tell you a baby is just tissue mass of the woman. Listen to the wisdom now of God. Wisdom starts with him. Luke 1.15. Talking about John the Baptist. Luke 1.15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And do you remember when Mary came to greet Elizabeth and the baby leaped in her womb? God's dealing with him as an individual before he's even born. Amen. Well, if that's not enough, Jeremiah 1.5. Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is what God said to Jeremiah. He says, before you were even born, before you were even formed in the womb, I knew you as an individual and began to call you to your destiny. So I would say that the baby in the womb is an individual. Wouldn't you say God does? Where does wisdom begin? With God. When you abandon God, your man's wisdom falls woefully short. And we begin to sink and sink and sink and sink. You do us good. Prosperity always comes through the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of men. Psalms 139, 13. Psalms 139, 13. For you performed my inner parts. You know, I'm sorry, you formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they are all written. The days fashioned for me when I was yet there, uh, when as yet there were none of them. In other words, he already had, he already had David's days already mapped out. He already had his days written before he was, a, while he was in his mother's womb. Is he dealing with children in the womb as individuals? He's calling them. He's got plans for them. That's the beginning of God's wisdom. 
And these are but a few scriptures that support that. So just because man didn't understand the wisdom of God didn't mean it wasn't a fact. Just because men thought that the earth rode on the back of an elephant back in the day doesn't mean that when God said the earth floated in its own without any support, that that wasn't a fact. It was a fact the whole time. It's just man's catching up. When they go to the source of wisdom, they get smarter. And it's happening all the time. Science is constantly lining up with what the Word says. Lining up with what the Word says. There's so many examples in Scripture of where God's wisdom was way in front of what we're discovering today. Man's limited wisdom is slowly catching up. Isn't it? Very slowly catching up. But we can be cutting edge with God's wisdom and do what He says rather than, we under, rather than be with our own understanding. And that's what Einstein was. When he found out that there was a beginning to the God's creation, then he started doing his model from that piece of wisdom and the whole scientific community now believes in that. I mean, that is just, that's just the fact now today. It started with God's wisdom. If we just start with God's wisdom, we could be far out ahead of where we're at today. Way far out ahead. Faith is what he says causes us, uh, faith is what he says, and what he says causes us to do before we understand, we need to, if we do what he says before we understand it, just take his wisdom for face value and do what he tells us to do, we will prosper. That's biblical prosperity. When by faith we believe what he tells us to do in spite of what the whole world's telling you, oh, you don't want to do that, oh, don't go there, oh, you don't want to get involved in it. If the whole world's telling you that, just say, yeah, but God said it. So all you PhDers, you just go do what you're going to do and you just go ahead and be, but I'm going to follow us for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do what he says. Amen. So, the subject is prosperity, isn't it? So when the Word says, Luke 6.38, I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Based on everything we just learned here, in Luke 6.38, in the Amplified, when Jesus says, Give, the gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will they pour into the pouch formed by the blouse of your robe and used as a bag. For with the measure you deal with, the measure in which you, when you confer benefits on others, it will be measured back to you. When that wisdom is shared with you by the Word of God, that God has put in His Word, when we see that, do we trust His wisdom or man's wisdom that goes, no, I don't see how that could be possible. How can you give and get something, and, and then something be given back to you? Well, you need to invest it. You need to do this with it. You need to do that with it. That's the conventional wisdom. But if God says to give and it'll be given back to you, in fact, it said that when you give, you, you'll get so much that back then they had their robes and they pulled them up like that, that their robes would be heaping with stuff. I don't understand it, but it works. Because the beginning of wisdom is what? from God. And if he told us that works, then we should. Forget all the financial counselors. If that's truth, then that's what we go with. Amen. Phew. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Second Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to someone, will also reap genu genuously and with blessings. In other words, it's a spiritual law. Let each one give as he has made his own mind and purpose in his heart. That is, you need to deliberately operate in this. It's something deliberately you've got to operate in. Not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves. He takes pleasure in. Prizes above other things. 
and is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. Now why is that? Because it, when you give joyfully, you're giving by faith. Believing his word and what he said. You're believing his wisdom over man's wisdom. Because you know that you know that you know that if I give cheerfully according to how the God has instructed me, there's blessings coming. There's blessings. I'm about to get blessed. Oh my gosh, God just directed me to, 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 to give to this in a certain amount. And I, man, I can't wait to do it because I know there's a blessing in this. Here it comes. I'm going to be blessed. Because His wisdom says so. But if you're doing it grudgingly and it says, oh man, here goes another 20 bucks down the drain. And you plump it in the bucket, you might as well keep it. Amen. But when you do it with faith, you are happy and can't wait to indulge. See the difference here? Because his wisdom is first. And that's how we prosper. And when we do that, verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing, come to you in abundance, so that you may always, under all circumstances, whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. If you believe that, you're going to be a cheerful giver. Because you know that's coming to pass. Even when all of the PhDs around you, all the financial PhDs are going, how could that possibly work? It don't. I don't care. God, wisdom starts with Him. And when we put our faith in Him, you're going to get what He says. We got to believe Him. It's the real deal. This is Heaven's financial working. So in closing, 2 Corinthians 9.10, just going to verse 10 now. In the Amplified, it says this. And God, who provides seed for the sower and bread for eating, will also provide and multiply you resources for sowing and increase the fruit of your righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. Now, Shiris and I, this was our first year of the Bible College. So 2009, 2010, it was that school year. Andrew had announced that he was going to break ground for a Bible college up here. And he had put out a proposal. He says, now if so many people, I don't know how many thousands of people, gave $3,333.33, then we could pay cash for this Bible college. And Sherris and I at the time were both unemployed, going, going to school there. We both didn't have a job. And we looked at that verse and went, well, now wait a minute here. He will provide the seed for us to sow. So we grabbed hands and go, God, we're believing you on this. Now, I don't see how in man's wisdom, how this is ever going to come to pass, how this would ever work. But his word says so, and the beginning of wisdom comes from God. And so we heard his word. We grabbed hands. We said, we're believing God for... Uh, uh, $3,333.33 because we want to sow into this project. And you know that we don't have the job or the monies to do this, but we, our eyes are upon you. And within a matter of a couple of weeks, some money came in unexpectedly. $5,000 came in to us unexpectedly. Our hands were shaking. We couldn't write the check fast enough. 3333 we knew it was God, and He gave us bread for eating. Are you willing to believe His wisdom over the conventional wisdom? If you're just willing, I mean, man, I'd really like to give that project. Well, then pick up this, this spiritual principle right here and start declaring it. And dedicate yourself. Now, I'm telling you, when the money comes in, don't eat your seed. Right. Sow it. Be honest with it. Prove yourself a good steward. Amen. When you go with God's wisdom over man's wisdom, you will prosper. 
And everybody and their dog is going to tell you, hey, you're not, that it. That, I mean, financial principles, I mean, that's just silly to even think or believe of such a crazy. I don't care. Take all your PhDs. I don't care, man. All your diplomas on your wall. I don't care. Wisdom begins with God, and I'm going with Him. When in doubt, go with God. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you and praise you that it's your wisdom that we're leaning on. It's your wisdom that we pursue. And when we see in your word instruction, we will obey your instruction. We will trust your instructions. We reverence you. We give you first place above all the PhDers, all the professors out there, all of their combined wisdom. We lay that aside if it does not match to your wisdom in your word. Because you've proven time and time and time again that wisdom begins with you. And your word is always way out in front of the conventional wisdom of limited man. And so we take your wisdom into our hearts and we believe and cheerfully believe that it's your purpose for us to prosper super abundantly. That, the key, that your kingdom would go out and be financed. And even as your kingdom is being financed, there's plenty enough for us to live very well. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your wisdom from your word. And so we will seek your word and seek the wisdom of your word. And we will do what your word says. Because it's in the doing of your word, not just mentally ascending to it, is where the power lies. Because we will do it by faith. Whether we understand it or not, we're going to do what you tell us to do. What your wisdom tells us to do. And so we just receive your word today and held that your wisdom is higher than all the wisdom in the earth. And we'll follow your wisdom and prosper as you voice purpose us to prosper. We do it your way, not man's way. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's anybody here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ,